series. This is our second in the series called Imperatives. And we are looking at statements of Jesus that, that are in the imperative. The Greek verbs, of course, have imperatives and or different moods, and one of which is the imperative. And we say imperative is a command. Uh, it's okay to refer to it that way, but it's not quite what we think of as a command. Uh, it, it's called the voice of uh, volition because it is the will of the speaker appealing to the will of the one being addressed. In other words, this is what I want you to want. It is a mood of uncertainty because we don't know if the one being addressed is going to actually do what is wanted of them, but we call it the imperative. It's not quite a command. It's, it's not like somebody has somebody else on the ground twisting their arm behind their back saying, say uncle. It's, it's like, I, I want you to say uncle. And, and there's good reasons why you should say uncle, but uh, imperative. So it's, it's like a command. And the first one we saw was John chapter 14, where Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. That's in an imperative. So God is saying, it is my will that you choose not to be troubled. And then he tells us how to do that. You believe in God? Well, here's another imperative. Believe specifically in me. And we looked at that whole passage on, let not your heart be troubled. Well, our imperative today is one phrase. I'll give you the scripture on it in a few moments. But here's the imperative for today. Jesus said these words, do this and live. Just write that phrase down. It'll make sense later. Do this and live. Now, if you went to the doctor and you said, okay, doc, how did the test come back? And he said, do this and live. You'd pay attention, wouldn't you? If, if the doctor said that to you, do this and live, you'd have a couple of questions on your mind. First of all, you'd want him to define what is meant by this. What is the this? Do this and live. Well, do what? Do, do this. Well, and then you'd actually want to do it. And you'd say, can I do it? How do I do it? Do this and live. Jesus gave this, and it's in the imperative, do. is in the imperative. I want you to want to do this, and the result is you'll live. That's a pretty good reason to do something, isn't it? You'll live. So that's our imperative for today. Do this and you will live. Now, Jesus made that statement in answer to one of the many trick questions that he was asked. Now, those religious authorities of his days, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, they were always trying to trick Jesus, and they never won that game. If, if you were playing and keeping score, trick Jesus game, they would never win. They asked him many trick questions. And they put a lot of effort into trying to find another question they could ask him, another trick question. Here's one, for example. They said, Jesus, what about paying taxes? And I'm sure that, man, we're going to get him on this one because if he says you're supposed to pay taxes, the people aren't going to like that. But if he says not to pay taxes, Rome's not going to like that. We got him on this one. And Jesus said, why are you testing me all the time? Give me a coin. Whose image is on it? You remember that. Brilliant. Brilliant, wise answer of Jesus just quieted them right down. Give unto Caesar what Caesar's, unto God uh, what, what is God's. And then here's another trick question. And boy, they must have spent a lot of time coming up with this one. Lord, there was this man, uh, and he had six brothers, so there's seven of them all together. He married a woman, and then he died before they had kids. So his brother married her, and then he died. And then so the other brother, and right down the line, all seven of them married her and died. Now whose wife will she be in the resurrection? <laughs> Man, I wouldn't be, that's not the issue. My issue is why is everybody marrying her? <laughs> you marry her, you're going to die. <laughs> and by the way, you talk about a hypothetical, ridiculous, does anybody know anybody that married seven brothers? And they all died before, I mean, but they, you know, they're trying, it was a trick question. But they didn't get him on it. They didn't get him on it. And then there was another, they came out and said, Lord, is it legal to divorce your wife? That one was loaded. Because at the time of Jesus, there were those that said, yeah, you can divorce your wife for any whim, any reason whatsoever. Then there were others that said, no, you, you don't divorce your wife for anything. 
if she commits adultery, you can stone her, but you don't divorce her. I mean, that was a loaded question. And Jesus said, no, it was for the hardness of your heart. Wow, he turned it right on them. The wisdom of Jesus. They, they could not get him on a trick question. They brought him a woman caught in the act of adultery. It was all a big setup. They, they said, she's been caught in the act of adultery. How do I know it was a setup? Well, if she's caught in the act, where's the guy? So it was a setup. They're trying to trick him. The law says, stoner, what do you say? Trick question. Jesus said, well, he wrote in the dirt. We don't know what he wrote. But as he's writing in the dirt, he says, let the one who has no sin throw the first stone. One by one, they thumped their stones to the ground and walked away. They lost again. They, they could not beat him at the trick question game. He did not deny the law, but he didn't allow this woman he cared for to be stoned either. What wisdom. That's incredible. Isn't that kind of wisdom? Another trick question. Uh, who is my neighbor? All kinds of, of trick questions. But Jesus' imperative that we're going to talk about today, do this and live, is in response to a trick question. Let me give you a trick question, just for fun. Don't say it out loud. Don't say the answer out loud for two reasons. One, if you're right, you're going to spoil it for other people in the room. And two, if you're wrong, you'll be really embarrassed. So, so don't say the answer out loud. I'm going to say something really fast. You might have to think of alternate words. But, but here's the question. Railroad crossing, look out for the cars. Can you spell that without using any R's? I'll say it again. Okay, you can, you can see if you get the answer. Don't say it out loud. I'll say it again real quick. You're thinking of different words, different alternatives. Let's see, automobile. Okay, here we go. Railroad crossing, look out for the cars. Can you spell that without using any R's? Here's the answer. Some of you know that you're whispering it to your... Here, here's the answer. T-H-A-T. That. Can you spell? Some of you are thinking, how do you do a railroad crossing? No, it was a trick question. I gave that to some high schoolers. I was giving a ride home. This is a true story. I give them a ride home from youth group one night, and, and, and they said, hey, Pastor, will you stop at Circle K and buy us a soda? And, and uh, you know, I get tired of buying these kids soda all the time. Just give them a ride. They always want something. And so I said, well, hey, I'll, I'll, I'll pull in there and buy you a soda if you can answer a riddle. And I did that to them. Railroad crossing, look out for the cars. Can you spell that? Without any, and they couldn't get it. And finally, one of them got all excited. He goes, I know the answer, Pastor. I know the answer. I said, okay, what's the answer? He said, IT. What? IT. You're trying to trick us with the word that. So IT. I said, you don't spell that, IT. He misspelled that. <laughs> and I'm such a sucker. I bought him a soda anyway. And I thought, our tax dollars at work right there in our... He misspelled that. I.T. Because <laughs> he knew another riddle. The answer to the other riddle was it. So that's what was on his mind. But trick questions. Well, here's the trick question that they were trying to get Jesus. And he gave this incredible imperative. Do this and live. Here's the trick question. Lord, Master rather, what is the greatest commandment? What is the greatest commandment? And, and they certainly thought they had him on this one because the religious leaders said there were 248 affirmative precepts. And what that means is 248, God said, you must do, you should do this, do this. You know, like a command, a positive, something to do. And they also said that there are 365 negative precepts, one for every day. And, and they believed there was uh, 248 body parts, so the, the scribe said, hey, there's, a, there's an affirmative uh, precept for every part of your body. Well, we know there's more parts than they knew of, but that's just what they said. And then they said, well, then there's, there's 365. That's one for every day, right? So, you know, it's Monday. Don't do this. It's Tuesday. Don't do that. And that's the way they viewed God, a bunch of don't do's. And you add them all up, and there's 613 in total. And, and they counted the letters of the Decalogue, which is that passage of Scripture containing the Ten Commandments, and they found there's exactly 613 letters in the Decalogue, so that completed it for them. I, I read that, and I thought, these guys had too much time on their hands. But of all those 613, quote, laws, which one is the greatest? Certainly we're going to get him on this one. 
And uh, the answer that he gave, I'll give you three references to write down. Matthew 22, 34 through 40. Mark 12, 28 through 34. Those are probably different events of the, different accounts of the same event. And then there's also maybe another event, Luke 10, 21 through 28. That's the story of the Good Samaritan following, following this statement. But here's what Jesus said. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. That's the greatest commandment right there. And you read Matthew's version of that, and when he finished talking, it says nobody could ask him any more questions. He won again. They still couldn't trick him. And, and, and he said various things in the different, he's recorded as saying different things in the different texts because they all give it a little different angle. But what is the greatest commandment? It, it is to the Lord your God is one and you are to love him with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength and love your neighbor as yourself. That's his answer. Now let's read Deuteronomy chapter 6 because that's what he was quoting and I'm going to just read a few verses, and he quotes it in, in verse 5, but here's what he was referring to. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you. Now, I don't know the significance of this, but notice how that's worded. This is the commandment, singular. These are the statutes and judgments, plural. So maybe God had one thing in mind all along. He said, God commanded to teach that you may observe them in the land in which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all his statutes and commandments which I command you, you and your son and your grandson all the days of your life, that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. Now that's what Jesus was quoting. You shall love the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind. And in Luke's version of this, he followed up that statement with these words, do this and live. He combined then Leviticus 19. So turn there. Leviticus 19. He said that's the first commandment. I love the Lord with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. And then he said love your neighbor as yourself. And that's a quote out of Leviticus 19. I'll read 13 through 18 for you. You shall not cheat your neighbor nor rob him. The wages of him who is hired shall not remain with you all night until morning. You shall not curse the deaf, nor put a stumbling block before the blind, but shall fear your God. I am the Lord. You shall do no injustice in judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor, nor honor the person of the mighty. In righteousness you shall judge your neighbor. You shall not go about as a talebearer among your people, nor shall you take a stand against the life of your neighbor. I am the Lord. You shall not hate your brother in your heart, you shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Notice he says, don't, don't carry a grudge and, and, and don't get your neighbor stoned by speaking out against him and, and pay him what you owe him and don't hate him in your heart. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so in talking to the rich young ruler in Matthew 19, it's interesting how Jesus used this very passage. The young ruler comes to Jesus and says, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus said, have you kept the commandments? Honor father, mother, don't steal, don't murder, uh, love your neighbors yourself. He kind of threw that right in there with what we call the Ten Commandments. Now Jesus said an amazing thing. And, and again, we're trying to understand, do this and live. Do what? Love God with all you got. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the this. But in Matthew twenty two forty, 40, Jesus gave that same answer, but he added this phrase. He said, because on these, all the law and the prophets hang on these. Wow. 
Jesus said, if you do these two things, love the Lord, and I'm going to just summarize, with, with everything within you, love Him, and love your neighbors yourself, you will be, you'll be taking care of all the law and the prophets. You don't have to worry about everything in the law if you just do these things. Love God with all you got. And, and the word hang, he says hang. On these, hang all the law and the prophets. Well, that word hang is on the screen for you. It's kremanuamai, kremanuamai. And the, the most usage of it in the New Testament refers to the cross. You hung him on a cross. And here's what that word means. It means to attach to for support. That's literally what it means. You attach to something, and whatever you're attached to is supporting you. And Jesus basically is saying here, the whole of the law and the whole of the prophets are attached to and held up by loving God with everything that is within you and loving your neighbors yourself. Now here these guys spent their lives defining the law and coming up with layers upon layers of law upon the law to make sure they kept the law. And they came with such ridiculous things like what is work on the Sabbath? You can't if you're a tailor carry a needle and stuff like that. And Jesus said, wait a minute, let's just make life really simple. Do this and live. Do what? Love God with everything that's in you. And love your neighbors yourself. And if you're doing this, loving God, loving your neighbor, well, all the law and all the prophets, they hang on this. They, they attach to it, supported by it. Well, let's look at the law for a moment. What are the first four of the Ten Commandments? Well, they all have to do with God. You know, don't, don't have any other God before you. Don't make any graven images. Don't use his name in vain. And Remember the Sabbath. Well, if you love God with all your heart, you won't have any problem with those. If you love God with all your heart, there's no room in your heart for any other God. You love Him with all your heart. Uh, you don't want to use His name in vain because you're just so in love with Him. And, and the Sabbath, man, that's a joy. That's not a burden. It's a joy to gather together. It's a joy to worship the Lord. It's a joy to honor God. Why? Because I love Him. So you're not going to have any trouble with those. Well, then the next six are all about how we relate to other people. Honor father and mother. Well, if you love them, you're going to honor them. And, and, and don't murder. I mean, that one's easy. We don't usually murder the ones we really love. Don't steal. If you really love somebody, you're not going to be stealing from them. And don't bear false witness. Don't commit adultery. Don't do that to them. That'll, that'll ruin them. Don't do that. And, and don't, don't carry uh, covetousness in your heart and don't bear false witness. You look at those six and you say, you know, if somebody really loves, they won't have any problem with those. So doesn't it make sense what Jesus said? The incredible, simple wisdom of Jesus. All the law hangs on, attaches to, and hangs on just loving God with all your heart and loving your neighbors yourself. Now, one of the men listening, and, and again, you're trying to harmonize this. He had, a, he had a response we'll look at, but write these scriptures down. Romans 13, 8 through 10, uh, 9 and 10 says, you know, this fulfills the law. And then 10 says, love does no wrong to his neighbor. Love, therefore, is the fulfillment of the law. Romans 15, 1 and 2. Now we who are strong ought to bear the weaknesses of those who are without strength, not just pleasing ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to his edification. Galatians 5.14, the whole law is fulfilled in one word. In the statement, you shall love your neighbors yourself. James 2.8, if, however, you are fulfilling the royal law, according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So it, it confirms what Jesus said. You, you fulfill the law by loving God with everything that's in your heart, everything that is within you. Now notice, notice Jesus didn't just say the law, however. And I wish I had pondered this more. It was a late thought this week, but it, it, it dawned on me. Yeah, I understand. I get it, what he says about if you love God with everything in you and, and you love your neighbor as yourself, then you're going to fulfill the law. But notice he also said, and the prophets. Well, what is the purpose of all that God has been doing in human history? Well, why did the prophets come? What, why, did, why was Israel called into being as a nation so they could bring Messiah? Why did Messiah come? So we could be redeemed and we could be restored to the way God originally created us to be. And how did God create us to be? He created us 
to be in His image. And what is God? So we say created in His image. Does that mean He has a nose? Is it physical? No, the Bible does tell us this. God is love. God is love. Matter of fact, I don't want to get too technical, but Matthew chapter 5, 44 through 48 says, Love your enemies and bless and do good and all that. That's an imperative too, by the way. And then he says, Be ye perfect, as your Father in heaven is perfect. That word perfect means teleos. It means come to what you are designed to be. That's what it means. Come to be what you were designed to be. Well, what were you designed to be? You were to be like God. And what is God? God is love. Could it be that it's this simple that all that God was ever doing in the world today was to bring us to the point where we would love Him with all of our heart and to love our neighbors ourself? Could it be that simple? Could everything God has been doing throughout human history to call Israel as a nation, to bring Messiah into the world so that our sins could be forgiven, so that we could be restored unto God, so that His image could be recreated in us so that we could love? Wow. Could it really be that simple? I think so. Because if you love the Lord, your God, there's only one of Him. There's only, the Lord is one. That means a unity. He's one, and you are to love Him with all your heart and soul and, and mind and strength and your neighbors, yourself. And if you do that, you fulfilled. You, the, the law, the prophets hang on this. Wow. You know what I love about God? I mean, I don't understand hardly any of Him, but... He's so simple. There's a philosophic axiom that says the closer to simplicity something is, the closer to perfection it is. We're not here to teach philosophy, but that makes some sense. The more complicated things get, the more they get messed up. But how simple can you be? What is life all about? Love God with everything you got. And love each other. And you'll live. Do this, and you'll live. Now, one of the guys in Mark's version of this answer to the trick question, one of the guys listening to Jesus, uh, he, he kind of had some follow-up statements, and, and the guy said, you know, uh, loving your neighbor and, and loving God is more important than sacrifice. Read it in Mark 12. And to this guy, Jesus said, when Jesus perceived that he answered with wisdom, Jesus said to this guy, you are very close to the kingdom of God. He didn't say you're in yet, but he said you're very close to the kingdom of God. And, and, and let me just strip it all away and what I think Jesus was getting at there. See, everybody in that crowd, the religious leaders and all those guys who were trying to trick him, they were extremely religious. And I think what Jesus was saying when he said to that guy, you're very close, he's saying when you come to understand that it's not about religion, but it's about heart, then you're close. Then you're close. It's not about your 613 do's and don'ts. It's not about your icons, your idols, and your religiosity. It's about your heart. And when you get to the point where you realize what God is really after is your heart, then you're close to the kingdom of God. It's not about earning it or achieving it. It's about heart. And so, what were the prophets all about? What was the law all about? So that God would work in human history, so that God could get to you as an individual and bring you to the place where you love Him and you love others. That's your life. Life isn't just about making money or creating things or building things. No, life is about loving God. Law and the prophets, it's what it's all about. Could it really be that simple? Yeah. Yeah. What do you want somebody to say about you when you die? What do you want them to say? Oh, he did this, he did that, she was great. You know what I think the best thing could ever be said about any of us when we die? Somebody just, just reflects upon our life and say, wow, he loved God. See, that says it all. She loved God. Because that's the law and the prophets. That's the greatest commandment of all. Because on this hang all the law and the prophets. And when you and I get that, we're close to the kingdom. It's about heart. It's not about religiosity. It's, a, it's about heart. And, and why did Jesus say this? Let's ponder this for a moment. 
Why did he say, do this? Now notice what he added, but he really didn't add. It's another quote. What is the greatest commandment? Well, the Lord our God is one. And so love him with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. He said, do this and live. Now I thought, well, that's a little out of play. What do you mean live? Well, he's quoting Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. Jesus was quoting scripture at his answers. And in Deuteronomy chapter 30, God has just followed up on warning Israel about the covenant they're in with him now. And if they violate that covenant, there's all kinds of curses that are going to come. If they, if they affirm and keep that covenant, there's all kinds of blessings that are going to come. And he says, the day is going to come when you're going into captivity because you're going to break covenant. But if you start seeking me with your whole heart and soul, if you come back to me with all your heart, with all your soul, and then he repeats it. He says, you'll live. If you do this, you'll live. That's where he, Jesus gets the quote. If you do this, you'll live. And by the way, that's that same passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30, that Paul uses in Romans chapter 10. This is fascinating. It's that same chapter, that same passage that Paul uses in Romans chapter 10, where he says the word of salvation, the word is near you, even in your mouth. If you believe in your heart the Lord Jesus was raised from the dead and confess with your lips that he's Lord, you'll be saved. And, and then he quotes this very same passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30. That's eternal life now, isn't it? Being saved. So this is a very important passage, Deuteronomy chapter 30. But Jesus said, do this and you'll live. You won't be, ble you won't be cursed, you'll be blessed. That's the context of this, do this and live. So you want to live a life of blessing? Well, love God. Love others. You'll be blessed. You'll live in that sense. You want to live a life of, of cursing? Well, be selfish. Don't love the Lord. Don't love anybody else. Love you. Just love you. And you'll, you'll have a nice cursed life. But if you, if you want to live, if you want to be blessed, then love the Lord with everything within you and love your neighbor as yourself. Deuteronomy, this is what God was out after all, the, all along. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12. What does the Lord require of you? It answers it. Fear Him, walk in His ways, to love and serve Him with all your heart and soul. Those two words are equated in several passages, heart and soul. Deuteronomy 11.1, 1, Therefore you shall love the Lord your God. Psalm 31.23, Oh, love the Lord, all you His saints. Joshua 22.5, this is what God is looking for, to love the Lord God, to walk in His ways, to keep His commands. I love this phrase, to hold fast to Him and to serve Him with all your heart and soul. Hold fast to Him. Cleave unto Him. Remember the, the first passage we referred to about marriage? For this reason a man shall leave father and mother. Cleave unto his wife. Hold fast. What does God want from you? What does he want from you? See, an imperative is the will of the speaker appealing to the will of the hearer. So what does God want from you? Does he want you to do some great sacrifice? Does he want you to die as a martyr? What does he want from you? He wants one thing. He wants you to love him. And to love him with all your heart. To love him with all your soul. To love him with all your strength. To love him. If you do that, everything's going to be good. You'll be blessed. Oh, well, you have trials? Yeah, but nothing, not, none of those trials will separate you from his love. Just love him. Just love him. Well, let's look at this phrase for just a few moments. What is it? Why does he break it down like this? Is he, is he just trying to give strong emphasis? Why does he say, love the Lord with all your heart and soul? Now, there are many passages, three times in Deuteronomy 30. Those two words are associated as equal, heart and soul. Love him with all your heart and soul. That's like the same thing. What is heart? What does that mean, heart and soul? Well, it's your inner life. It's your emotions. It's your will. It's, it's, it's the seat of your volition. It's, when you say heart, we kind of intuitively know what that means. It's hard to define, but we kind of intuitively know when somebody says, he did it with all his heart. Here's the way I like to word that. Do it with your want to. Don't do it with your have to. Do it with your want to. I want to. 
That means your, your heart is in it. Ephesians chapter 6, Colossians chapter 3. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. Do it with all your heart. Do it with sincerity of heart. And do it heartily or with all your heart. That's the thought we have is to have a passion in the inner person for something. To do it with all your heart. And after all, 1 Samuel chapter 16 says God looks upon the heart. Proverbs chapter 4 says, guard your heart with all diligence. Out of it flow the issues of life. It's, it's always, it always has been about heart. So what does it mean to love God with all my heart? Well, one negative we've got to get out of the way. I'll tell you what it can't mean and what it can't include. And that's loving the world. The Bible, not people in the world, but loving the system of the world, loving the values of the world. The Bible says in 1 John 2, it defines what he means by world, world, the pride of life, the lust of the flesh, the pride of the eyes. And he says, if you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. So if you're trying to love God with all your heart, strength, and mind, and you're loving the world, you can't do it. You can't do it. So before we define it even more, we've got to get that one taken care of. You can't. And in 2 Timothy 4.10, it says, Demas, he's forsaken us because he loved the world. See, he couldn't follow on because he, he loved the world. Jesus put it this way, you can't serve God and mammon, Matthew 6, 24. You can't serve God and money and the things of this world. You can't do both. You can't have two masters. You're going to love one and hate the other. You can't do both. You've you got to choose one. And maybe that's the echoing of that first phrase of, of Deuteronomy. The Lord is one. So let your heart be unified toward this one. Don't have a divided heart for all different all different things. James 4, 4, don't you know that friendship with the world makes you an enemy of God? So here we say, I, I want to love God with all my heart, and yet we're friends and, and loving the world. It can't be done. Here's something else that's hard for us to understand, and that is that Jesus uses the word agape. Linguists have studied this word agape. Where does it come from? Where, how do I understand this word agape, love? It's a Greek word that is used in the, in the Gospels for Jesus saying love. But in John 13, 34, remember Jesus said, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love each other? Well, that's not new. We read Leviticus about loving each other, but he used the word agape. That is new. Linguists have, have, have said this. I quote Cottle out of USC. He said this, that in all the Greek literature we have, we cannot find the word agape before the time of Christ. That fascinates me. Why wasn't it in use before the time of Christ? Maybe he originated the word. And then they tried to break it down. Where did the word, what is it, components is this word made of? The best they can figure, and it's only speculative. It's scholarly speculation. It's not inspiration. But, but that it comes from two words, more or much and again. And I can't prove that, but I like that. What is, what is the agape love of God? It means you always love more and again, more and again, more and again. Agape love of God is always increasing. We love him more and again, and he loves us more and again, always increasing. The agape love of God is unconditional. While we were yet his enemies, Christ loved us. And so it's unconditional. And, and a sacrificial greater love has no man than this. Then he laid down his life for his friend. That's how he defines agape, the willingness to sacrifice and unconditional and always increasing. And he said we're to love him that way. That if we learn to love him, agape love, we're fulfilling the law and the prophets. And, and we'll live. We'll be blessed. That's what he's talking about. And he says, with all your heart, with, with everything that's within you. And, and we know he says well, you'll, you'll find him when you love him with all your heart, when you seek him with all your heart, rather. And he talks about our soul in Psalm 42, thirsting for God. That's love, isn't it? Man, I thirst for God. Psalm 73, 25, Psalm 84, 12. There's, there's none in heaven but you. I mean, that's love, and that's, that's thirsting for God. I mean, that's our, your whole heart. Oh, that's, that's what he's talking about. And, oh, Lord, help us to love you that way. Sometimes we try to love God with a divided heart. We, we say, Lord, I want you to be my everything, but I really do kind of like this over here. Now, that's a divided heart. The Lord is one. The Lord is unified. Love him with all, with all your heart. And that's all, that's all he's looking for. He doesn't need you to do anything great. He doesn't need me to do anything great. He created us to love. That's, that's the whole design. And what does it mean with your mind? 
It's your mind. Well, that word for mind in the Greek means deep thought or imagination. So it does have to do with your thoughts. Loving God with your thoughts. And, and why did God destroy the earth under the flood of Noah's time? Genesis 6, 5, God saw that the intentions of man's heart, the imaginations of his heart, that word can be used interchangeably, the, the intentions, the imaginations of his heart was only evil continually. They did not like to retain God in their thoughts. You read Romans chapter 1, their foolish heart darkened because of their mind. Our minds are alienated from God. Uh, we read in the scriptures, that we're, we're, we, we are seeing in Ephesians chapter 4, 17 and 18, we walk in the futility of our mind. We walk with a darkened imagination when we don't know God. Colossians 1, 21, we were enemies in our mind. Romans 8, 7, the carnal mind, the mind without the spirit is an enemy with God. I mean, you read all these passages. He talks about, and when you come to Jesus, He wants to renew your mind. Romans chapter 12, verse 1. When you were, when you were falling in love, remember, think about your spouse, and you're falling in love, and you just, I would just call up Lorraine and say, hey, I'm, I'm thinking about you. And she'd just go, oh. What does that mean? I wasn't promising her anything. I didn't buy her anything. I just was thinking about her. And, ah, oh, we're in love. Why? I'm on his mind. I need to remember that one. That one's free. You know, just call him up. I was thinking about you. Well, do we honor God with our mind? How many times in the day do we just kind of stop and say, God, you're awesome? You're just on my mind. You're awesome. My thoughts are toward you. God, you're, you're wonderful. God, thank you. God, you're so holy. Jesus, you're so wise. Do, do, we, do we love him with our mind? Our minds need to be renewed in knowledge, Colossians 3.10. We're going to be thinking on good, lovely, praiseworthy things, Philippians 4.18. The meditations of our heart are to be acceptable unto him, Psalms 19.14. Love him with your mind. Hebrews 8, 10, and 10, 16. He says, I'll write my law, not only on your heart, but here he uses the word mind. I'll write my law on your mind. We need to love him that way. Ephesians 4, 23, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. See, that's why, that's why the world, with all its advertisements and pornography and, and all these intrusions on our mind, what is, what is the world trying to get at? It's trying to get at our love of God. It's trying to keep us from loving Him with all of our mind. Because when we love God with all of our heart, and we love God with all of our mind, we are fulfilling His purpose for our life. We are becoming what He designed us to be. And all the law and all the prophets hang on loving Him with all your heart and all your mind. Oh, could it really be this simple, God? How complicated we've made it. And then he says, love him with all your strength. The Greek word there for strength means force. And I believe that word can have two meanings, both of, of which apply. One is your, your physical strength to literally serve God with your body. Do something with this flesh. Do something with these muscles and sinew and, and, and all that, all these fat cells. Do something with it that will serve God. Go help somebody. Use your body to serve the Lord. And doesn't the Bible speak about our bodies? Romans 12, 1, a living sacrifice unto God. 2 Corinthians 5, 10 says we will be judged by what we did in this body. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, 19 and 20 says you bought with a price. You're the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Therefore glorify God with your body. See, how we live in this body is important to God. You, realize, you did this without thinking, so now you're going to get a free blessing right here. You, you moved your body and you came to this place today. That honors God. That honors God. You got up. You made yourself, for the most part, presentable. <laughs> and and, 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 and you, you changed location and, and you worshiped God together with other believers and he was pleased with that. And See, this is, you did all this with your body. So it's, oh, you know I, know, I know I miss church, but I'm there in spirit. No, that doesn't count. Get your body there. 
How, how are we going to pull off this VBS? People got to use their bodies. How, how did Andrew minister to the people in Uganda? He had to get his body there. Serve God with your strength. So use our physical activities to serve God. But you know this word for force? It can also be used, and there's scriptures on the screen about serving God and serving with all your heart and with all your soul. But I also like this thought, with your determination, your force of will. This word can apply to your will. Are you determined to live for God? Is there a force of will in your life that now that you've met Jesus with all your will, with all your want to, with all your force, you're going to serve God no matter what. That's, that's what he's looking for. Serve him. Write this phrase down. Love is doing. Jesus said, do this. What are you talking about? Loving. Do it. There's a lot of doing to love. It's not just feeling. We rejoice in the feeling. We enjoy the feeling. But love is far more than feeling. Love is doing. So do love. Do this and live. Ask yourself a few questions. Just say to yourself, the choice I'm about to make, if you're making a choice, see, you're, you're using your, your volition, you're using your, your force of will, you're about to choose something. How does this choice reflect love of God? If you're going to engage in an activity, how does this activity reflect love of God? How, how do the inner contents of my heart, how do they reflect love of God? Because this is what God is looking for in us, is to love Him. And you know... When you're in love, that's, that's fun. When you're in love, that's good. When you're married to somebody and, and you're not in love, I mean, that's a burden, that's drudgery, but when you're married to somebody and you're still in love, that's great, that's life, that's do this and live. It's great to be in love. That's why everybody wants to be in love. Love is a good thing. It can be costly, it can hurt you, but it's always worth it. Love God with all your heart, with all your soul. When you die, trust that somebody will stand up somewhere and say, she loved God. He loved God. That's how I remember them. They love God. Hallelujah. Well, we only got a couple minutes, but you'll probably get mad at me for this one anyway. What does it mean to love your neighbor as yourself? What does that one mean? We misunderstand this one greatly. You know, some of you in this room probably remember Whitney Houston. You guys, how many of you know who Whitney Houston is? Singer, really a great voice, right? She did all those different, she'd go high and low and all over the place. And one of her, one of her hit songs was Greatest Love of All. Learning to love yourself. Sounds nice. It sounds really good, doesn't it? But this is an imposition of psychology. This isn't in the Bible. It, it, there are those today that are saying, well, I can't love anybody else because I can't love me. No, the reason you're not loving everybody else is because you're loving you. I know that steps on toes because we've, ex we've accepted this one, hook, line, and sinker, but if you just look at what the Bible says, it does not teach us to love self. Do a little study of the word self. Just, just a simple study of the word self, and you'll find Jesus saying things like, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to take up your cross. What do you do? To die to self. Paul said, I die daily. What did he mean by that? Dying to self. Humbling yourself. Preferring others over yourself. These are the common teachings of the Bible. Not love yourself. We become a very narcissistic people, and that's one of our problems. Where it's all self, self, self. Well, no, no, Jesus said, you want to really live? Then get away from self. And love God with everything you got. And love your neighbor. Now, what does he mean then when he says love your, love your neighbor as yourself? And I had to chuckle at this one because God knows exactly where we're at. But that Greek word for as, now it can be translated different ways. To be upfront about it, it can be translated different ways. But that Greek word hos, H-O-S, you know one way of translating that word is how greatly. Jesus literally could be saying... Love your neighbor how greatly you're loving yourself. In other words, you're already loving yourself. Now stop doing that and love somebody else. Don't even think about yourself anymore. Love somebody else. 
Love your neighbor as you are loving yourself. And certainly all those things we saw in Leviticus 19, don't hold a grudge, don't, don't bear false witness, don't, don't, don't hate them, pay them, do good unto them. There, there's a lot in the Bible about how to treat a stranger if you're Israel. When they come among you, treat them as yourself. Treat them as one of your people. He's just talking about how to love other people. And one of the biggest barriers to loving others is I, I, I'm always putting me in that place. Now, this isn't scriptural, this little, ac- uh, uh, this little acrostic, but I think it's interesting. A joy, someone said joy is to, to live in this order. J, Jesus first, O, others second, you last. Live that way and you'll have joy. See, God loves you. I'm not saying that you're worthless. I'm not saying you're, you're a worm in the dirt. No, you, you are created to love God's kind of love. But stop thinking about you. I've got to stop thinking about me and think about him and think about you. And then I'll be blessed. Jesus said, you'll fulfill all. If I'm only thinking about me, I might want what my neighbor has. That's covetousness. If I'm only thinking about me, I might want to take what he has. That's stealing. But if I want to fulfill the law, I'm going to say, no, I need to prefer the other person more than myself. I'm going to love God with all my heart, and I'm going to love other people how greatly I'm loving me. It's it's a real shift, isn't it? But that's, I believe, what God is teaching us. And remember the golden rule? The golden rule is not whoever has the gold rules. (laughs) That's not it. The golden rule is... However you want people to treat you, treat them. So if you want to think about you in that way, okay, well, how, if I have sinned, what would I want people to do? I want them to forgive me, so I'm going to forgive them. If I'm stumbling, what would I want people to do? I would want them to help me, to instruct me, so I'm going to help and instruct them. If I'm hungry, what would I want people to do? I'd want them to feed me, so I'm going to feed them. See, the, to love your neighbor as yourself always maybe starts with you, but then shifts it to them shifts it over to the other person. And isn't that what Jesus did? He was God, always is God, but He humbled Himself, He emptied Himself, and have this same mind in you that was in Christ, that even though He was equal to God and thought it not robbery to be equal to God, yet He made Himself of no reputation. That's what it says. Why? For you, for the other. You talk about loving your neighbor as yourself. I think that's the cross lived out right there. Humbling himself, not saving himself, but saving you, saving me. That's love. That's love. See, now, here's a real subtle thing. Satan is really subtle. Here's a real subtle thing. If you think you have to love yourself before you can love others, listen to this. The flaw in your thinking is you think you're the source of love. And you're not the source of love. God is love. And so we, we put ourselves in the back seat and we say, Lord, I want to love you with all my heart. I want to love other people. And 1 John chapter 3 says that we must love indeed, not just in word. If somebody's hungry or, or in need, we, we put action to it. I think that's why Jesus said, do this and, and live. And, and that's the story of the Good Samaritan. That's a follow-up of this question. What's the greatest commandment? Luke 10. Love your neighbor as yourself. Here, let me close. This is a really important question we close with. How can I do this? I mean, how can, how can I? We all know our hearts. We all know this is not, not our natural inclination to love God with all our heart. It's not our natural inclination to love others rather than ourselves. That's not our natural bent. So how can we do this? Jesus said, do this and live. Well, let me give you three things to write down and and not just write them down, but really embrace them. Number one, receive his love. 1 John 3, 1, behold, what manner of love is this? And literally in the Greek that says this this love doesn't come from here. No, this love that we're talking about comes from somewhere else. 1 John 4, verse 19 says we love him because he first loved us. So we must receive his love. That's step number one. If I want to love God with all my heart, if I want to love others rather than myself, I must receive his love. I must have love from God because I can't be the source of it myself. 
And so, Romans 5, 5, the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Spirit that He has given us. So receive God's love. Number two, God needs to do an operation on our heart. In Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6, where it said, you, you know, to, to do this and live, it says, and the Lord will circumcise your heart that you can love Him with all your heart and soul. In other words, we do not have a heart that is capable of this kind of love until God does an operation in our heart. In order for this kind of love to flow through our hearts, we not only need to receive it from God, but we need God to do an operation. We need God to do something to our hearts. Colossians chapter 2 calls this the operation of God, the circumcising of our inner person. The cutting away of the flesh, that old stony heart. And, and 1 John 5, 1 through 5 says, you've got to be born of God if you're going to love like this. In order to love like this, you, you must be born of God. And 1 John 4, 10, uh, 8 through 10 says, God is love, and, and whoever loves like this has been born of God. See, we need a miracle birth in our life if we're going to love God with all our heart because our sinful hearts are not capable of this kind of love. So I need to receive His love, and, and then I need to allow God to do that work of giving me a new heart, a heart He can put His Spirit in, a heart He can write His law within, a heart He can flow His love through. And then last of all, here's where our choice comes in. Having received His love and having been born of God, born again, now the choice is ours to act on this love. The love is doing Love must always be acted upon. I quoted 1 John 3, 14 through 18 uh, before about don't love just in word, but love in deed. In other words, we put action to, to our hearts and, and we say, Lord, I receive your love. And always oh, we, we know the joy of forgiveness. We know the joy of his presence and our life is overwhelmed with his love. But then we have to choose to act in love toward others and choose to act in love toward him because love is doing. Do this, do this, and live. That really is the greatest commandment. Let's stand together and Connie and worship team as you come to close us in song. I, I don't want to close this service before I give an opportunity for you to pray. For you to just pause for a moment and say, yes, I want to love you like that, Lord. And there might be someone here or someone listening that, that, that something resounded on the inside of you and said, yeah, I, I want to love God like that, but I just don't find myself able to love Him like that. It's, it's kind of foreign. I, I hear the words, but no, you need to be born again. You, you, you need to open your heart right now and say, Jesus, come into my heart. You need to say, Lord, I'm going to turn away from self and I'm going to get off the throne of my own life and I want you to be the Lord. I, I'm willing to humble myself. Come into my life, Lord Jesus. Let me have a love that is beyond me. There's a lot of pain in love. That's why some people harden their heart. They'd rather get a hard heart than to keep on hurting because someone they love is not doing right or or receiving them or and so we hard no don't don't do that keep your heart soft keep hurting it's worth it it's what it's what you're created for to love God with your whole heart and and you only have one heart you can't say well I'm going to love God but I'm not going to love him or her no you can't do that you it's loving God and your neighbor as yourself And so if there's anything in your heart you need to lay aside today, just say, God, I, I want to set this aside so I can love you more. I need to receive your love. I need you to do a work in my heart. But then every single day, you and I will have choices to make. Will we act on love? Will we, will we act on it? You act on it enough and you'll realize it's there. But love that's not acted on soon begins to dissipate. Do this and live. So let's worship the Lord as we close and commit our hearts to Him. It's not about religion, it's about heart.
Love him with all your heart. Oh, the joy of that. Love him with all your heart. And then love your neighbor. And guess what? You're not going to be hurt. You say, well, if I don't, if I don't love me, what's going to happen to me? You'll be okay. God will bless you. Do this and live. Do this and have blessing. God will take care of you. Hallelujah. Let's, let's just worship him. And then Pastor Lloyd will close us in prayer.